Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to News 3 Now Live at 4. It's, it's Friday. Bruno's not here this I week. I know, so it's a little <laughs> lackluster. I'm excited. He's here, but, but we have a report, but he's yeah. not here. Yeah, yeah. Danica Lewis in for Susan Simon one more time. Thanks for filling out, of helping course. out this week. Yeah, absolutely been happy to anytime. It's been a lot of fun. It has been a lot of fun. And here's what's making news on this Friday. It is finally time to get out on the water, but it doesn't do you any good if your boat goes missing. Madeline O'Neill has a warning from Madison Police. Another bill that bans abortions is waiting on a signature, and this time it's in Missouri. We'll tell you what kind of limits that would establish. And it's hard to avoid the gridlock on Verona Road these days. Keely Arthur will let us know what's next for that big construction project. Not a good driving day in general, no. and not really a good weekend. Let's not. take a look at the weather where it's a look outside. I mean, that looks nice. It's yeah. a little deceiving there, but you can see the reflection in the water. It's a pretty gray sort of day. We are staying unsettled. Some drops fall in there, yeah. I think so. You can certainly get used to it, that's for sure. Dave Caulfield is out on the weather patio for us, and Dave, any drops out there yet? Uh, not right now, uh, Danica and Mark, but we could see some more showers and thunderstorms as we get into later this afternoon and evening. Really, these shower and storm chances are staying with us through much of the next 48 hours or so. Right now, we're seeing those thunderstorms across portions of Minnesota and Iowa, but not really much showing up in southern Wisconsin, and that's good news, giving us a little bit of an extended break, and in this case, an extended break is like six hours from the rain. We still do have the clouds with us, though, in Madison on the WIC TV Skycam. Temperatures are in the mid-50s, so much, much cooler than yesterday at this time. In fact, about 20 to 25 degrees cooler across the board, basically, for southern Wisconsin because of that cloud cover. We saw a few showers earlier today, but not much in the way of rain. We have these northeast winds keeping us dry and keeping us cool right now, and that is uh, preventing a lot of the shower activity from spreading a little bit farther to the north and east. Also, that front is a little bit farther to the south and west, which helps as well. So dew points in the 30s and 40s, that's not really going to produce that much in the way of rain. However, we still do have those thunderstorm chances in the forecast for this evening as we head through the 6, 8, and 10 p.m. hours. Temperatures will continue to fall through the 50s into the upper 40s. So I have that umbrella ready to go. We need to have it attached at our hip over the next couple of days, that's for sure. And uh, let's take a look right now at our first alert traffic update. We are looking at the interstate right now at County S. We are seeing some delays. It is a Friday on the Beltline, so we're seeing more delays on our traffic map, as you might expect. But no major accidents or incidents to report. Traffic is generally heading out at the speeds that you would expect for a Friday afternoon. 13 minutes right now from eastbound Verona Road to John Nolan Drive with an average speed of around 20 miles per hour. Some other routes in and around Madison are looking better. Middleton to Sauk City, 17 minutes with an average speed of around 60 miles per hour. And that is your first alert traffic update. We have to talk more alert days in the forecast for this weekend and maybe when we can put the umbrella away for <laughs> about 12 hours or so coming up <laughs> in your first alert forecast. Take anything we can get at this point. Exactly. All right, Dave, thank you. We'll see you in a few minutes. So first and foremost, when it's not raining, mm -hmm. the weather is finally nice enough for us to get back out on the water. But that's difficult if you go to pick up your kayak and it's gone. Madeline O'Neill can tell us about a string of recent kayak thefts on Madison's east side, Maddie. Well, Madison police say they often see this kind of crime with bikes, but they say kayaks is a new one. Daniel Kreischer keeps his kayak locked up and stored at the city's Tenney Park racks. Tuesday night, he saw it was gone. He searched a kayak on Craigslist and sure enough, there was his boat. But with the help of police, he was able to get it back. And it turns out the suspected thief had stolen more than one. Kreischer wants other kayakers to be on the alert. From now on, I'm going to try and be more careful uh, when I lock it up and keep it locked at all times, knowing that people are out there uh, eyeing these things up. Madison police say they found a number of kayaks at the suspect's house and believe he had been stealing them to sell on Craigslist. Police were able to return another kayak to a second victim, but still have three and are looking for their rightful owners. If your kayak is missing, give Madison police a call. And as of now, the suspect is facing two counts of theft. Lock them up. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the kayaks. Not, thing well, is, maybe yeah, the, right. guy, maybe like, the guy too. <laughs> right. It's like with bike locks, you can cut through them, so you have to oh. be careful. Yeah. All right. Maddie, thank you. You're welcome. So on the heels of a controversial abortion law passing in Alabama this week, Missouri's governor is expected to sign a bill 
that would ban the procedure there after eight weeks of pregnancy. Protesters actually gathered outside the state capitol after the legislature approved that measure today. If this bill is signed, doctors who perform those unlawful abortions could face up to 15 years in prison and lose their medical license. The trauma that this is doing to the women that I've worked with and the families of this state and how triggering all of these conversations are is just unbearable. Exactly why we are here today. To protect the life of the unborn, to preserve and respect the liberty of those babies who have no voice of their own to say that they want to live. Four other states have passed laws that prohibit an abortion once a fetal heartbeat is detected, which can happen right around the six-week mark before some women even know they're expecting. A report released today shows a former Ohio State University team doctor abused at least 177 students in his time at the school. Dr. Richard Strauss, who died by suicide in 2005, he worked at Ohio State from 1979 to 1997. Accusers say they were groped and touched inappropriately during exams. Students described as questionable exam nominations as, quote, a rite of passage, saying coaches, trainers, and other doctors for the athletic department knew about the behavior. The university's president says it's clear there was a consistent institutional failure in Ohio State's response. The school faces two lawsuits that allege officials knew about the allegations of sexual misconduct and did nothing about them. The U.S. and Iran continue to point fingers at one another as tensions escalate between those two countries, yet both sides say they do not want to go to war. The president disputed news coverage on Twitter, calling it fraudulent and highly inaccurate, as well as dangerous. He added, at least Iran doesn't know what to think, which at this point may very well be a good thing. Iran's foreign minister tweeted in response, saying with his team doing one thing and the president doing another, the U.S. doesn't know what to think. The president has sent B-52 bombers and an aircraft carrier strike group to that region. Administration officials gave a classified briefing on Iran to a small group of bipartisan lawmakers known as the Gang of Eight. They are expected to brief the full House and Senate next week. More local news now. Distressed drivers will likely welcome the changes eventually <laughs> coming to Verona Road. Yeah, road construction has caused heavy traffic in the area. Keely Arthur joins us with what updates you should know about. Keely? Well, Mark and Danica, drivers on Verona Road and surrounding intersections experienced really long wait times. At times, it felt more like you were at a parking lot rather than on a road. The traffic signal timing now changing as a result to prevent trapping vehicles. To minimize traffic further, turn restrictions will go into effect Wednesday at County PD, Nesbitt Road, and Capek Road. Specifically, left turn restrictions and through movement restrictions from Capek Road to eastbound PD. Anyone that wishes to make that movement will either need to use the Fitrona Road extension that travels through the quarry up to Highway PD near the Super Target. Otherwise, they can take a right turn out and then head west on PD itself. Something to look forward to. Two bridges are going up to carry Verona Road traffic over McKee Road starting this fall. Also, around the same time, three lanes of traffic will open up on each side of Verona Road further reducing traffic delays. But there is still a long road ahead for this project. Overall, it won't be completed until 2020, uh, of fall of 2020. So brace yourself. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be nice when it's done, right? Yes. Uh, something we'll definitely to be done, too. No, look at that optimistic attitude. There you go. All right. Thank you, Keely. When we come back, we have a conversation with CBS's Scott Pelley. We will talk about his new book, Truth Worth Telling, a reporter's search for meaning in the stories of our time. That is when Live at Four continues.
Well, a pair of businessmen in London got much more than they bargained <laughs> for while ordering wine with their meal. So the two scrolled through the menu and chose a $300 bottle of Bordeaux. However, the manager in training grabbed another bottle by accident, the most expensive wine in the restaurant that's worth nearly $6,000. Yes, that actually drank the whole thing um, unknowingly, and we only noticed that it was this wine when uh, we cleared the table. <laughs> so he was all smiles there, and the steakhouse even tweeted, poking fun at the mishap, saying the two bottles look, you know, pretty similar. And the CEO even said, chin up, that staff member who made the mistake, she still has her job. Well, that's good to hear. Yes, most definitely. <laughs> $6,000 for a bottle of wine. I don't think I could enjoy that. I, I'm sure I could if somebody I know, else but, bought yeah, it. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, stocks closed lower as trade woes returned to the floor. The Dow Industrials fell 98 points, ending the week at 25,764. The NASDAQ Composite Index lost 81, and the S&P 500 was off 16. Over the years, CBS journalist Scott Pelley has introduced us to some incredible people, and now he is sharing some of his most memorable stories in a book. That's right. The memoir is called Truth Worth Telling, a reporter's search for meaning in stories of our times. And joining us now is Scott Pelley. He is in New York. Thank you so much for taking some time, Mr. Pelley. We really appreciate Good it. Good afternoon, Scott. Oh, Danica, Mark, great to be with you, but you are going to have to call me Scott. Okay, okay. all right. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so, Scott, um, truth worth telling. Truth is getting harder and harder to discern nowadays. So what do you want people to get out of that title? And hopefully once they get through the 400 plus pages, this, this book. You know, Danica, it, it seems to me that we're living in this moment right now, which is a little unsettling in which the truth can seem to be made a lie and a lie can seem to be made the truth. And I wanted to remind people in this book that the truth is a real thing. Uh, it is verifiable and that that's what journalists do is report the truth as best they can determine it. And I wanted to write a memoir, but I didn't want to write a memoir that was about me. I didn't think anybody <laughs> would care about that. So <laughs> true, I've written <laughs> a memoir. I've written a book about the, the most fascinating people that I've met in this long and, and wonderful career and the values that they showed the world during some of the most difficult times we've faced. Speaking of which, you start the book with 9-11. Why did you start there? Mark, you know, it was just the, the most wrenching and consequential event of my life. Uh, I was at the World Trade Center when the buildings came down and watched the firefighters of the FDNY charging into those buildings against just the chance that they might be able to save someone and in a sense I I watched them killed as the as the buildings were down to earth and so that's a life-changing experience for anyone who was standing there at the time and the sacrifice the largest loss of life of any emergency service in history uh, just moved me so much that I wanted to pay pay tribute to them one of the things we say in the book is don't ask the meaning of life. Life is asking, what's the meaning of you? And with these firefighters, think about it, they didn't know what 9-11 was about. They didn't know who attacked us, but it didn't matter because they knew what they were about. They had sworn to protect the cities of the citizen, the, the, the citizens of the city of New York. And on that day, they did what they knew they had to do. Have you answered that question, Scott, the, the meaning of you? Wow, what a great question. Uh, you know, I think the meaning of me right now is to act as a stepping stone for the next, journalist, the next journalists who are coming up. Uh, journalism is so vital to our country. There's no democracy without journalism because the founders gave us, we the people, the power over the government. And the only way we can exercise that power is with reliable, accurate information. That's the role of journalism in this country. You know, uh, James Madison wrote that freedom of the press is the right that guarantees all the others. As long as we can say what we want to say, read what we want to read, hear what we want to hear, then all of our other rights will be protected. And those are the stakes of journalism, and that's what I'm trying to tell young people these days. Please join us 
in this profession. We need you, and we'd be proud to have you. There was a time there was just, you know, legacy news sources, the three networks, maybe the New York Times. Now, news is everywhere, and you mm -hmm. don't really know what is truth and what is not. Well, that, that's true, Mark, and, and we live in this, this time, unprecedented in human history, where never before has more information been available to more people, and that's a great thing. But it's also true that never in human history has more bad information been available to more people, and that's where journalism comes in. We're the antidote to gossip. If you hear something and you wonder, God, could that possibly be true? That's when you go to a source of news that you trust, like WISC in Madison or, or CBS News, and you, you check those facts because when you go to a brand name like your station, at least you know that the people there have been trained in journalism and they're being supervised by people who've been in journalism for 10, 20, 30 years. And there are enormous consequences to your reputation if you get something wrong. And so we're working like hell all day in your newsroom and mine to get everything right. We cer certainly are. Yeah. Truth worth telling, Scott Pelley. Good, best of luck on the book. We will see you soon on 60 Minutes. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. Mark, Danica, great to be with you. Thank you. We'll be right back. Well, take a look at this. A young moose decided it wanted to freshen up in the Baltic <laughs> Sea in Lithuania. People living nearby say moose comes to their neighborhood from time to time. This year they've seen two moose. There's a mice. Mooses. 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 No, I think it's just moose. But anyway, they're all young. Experts say that <laughs> moose in the sea is not a rarity. Moose drink seawater and they like to freshen up and swim.
Check them out. Who can blame them? Prancing. Ride the waves. Prancing. Prancing. <laughs> Borderline prancing in that sea. So, as getting staying with the animal trend today, we do have some sad news. Quite possibly the most famous cat on the internet has died. I'm sorry, Dave. I, it was. It's a tough day in the news, <laughs> that's for sure. Her name was Tartar Sauce, but the world knew her as Grumpy Cat. The sour faced feline took the web by storm with a mug that launched a thousand memes, not to mention a huge following, millions of fans strong. Also launched the Grumpy Cat Limited Company, a company that's made millions of dollars churning out all kinds of merch. She'll be remembered for a frown that brought smiles to millions. Grumpy Cat was only seven years old and died from medical complications. I'm telling you, when I saw this news this morning, I saw it was, you know, kind of cloudy and gray outside. And, and then the day got and worse. I, yeah, and I was grumpy and, and sad all day. Poor yeah. Grumpy. Yeah. Poor Grumpy. I did see some pretty epic uh, memes today all over the internet featuring Grumpy Cat. Like going to heaven and saying, I hate this. <laughs> that one was particularly good. It was good. Brought, so, brought well. a lot of smiles. Yeah, yeah exactly. definitely. Rest in peace. Yeah, this forecast not bringing a lot of smiles. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, grumpy cat memes are definitely appropriate for the next couple of days because we have uh, lots of chances for showers and storms. We'll go over all of them and talk about chances for some severe weather this weekend in your first alert forecast in just a few minutes. Good afternoon. I hope you had a really nice Friday so far. We've been dealing with the rain showers over the past 24 hours or so. We'll plot the last two days as far as rainfall goes and generally looking at about a half an inch to an inch of rain closer to Madison. Those showers that produce that fantastic looking shelf cloud that really, really cool cloud in the sky 
uh, yesterday morning produced about a half an inch of rain at the airport closer to southwestern Wisconsin. Some isolated spots, actually some pretty scattered spots, shall we say, of about one to two inches of rain. But with the storms that just missed us to the south last night, look at this four inches of rain across portions of Iowa closer to the Interstate 80 corridor, four and a half inches of rain for north uh, northern Illinois, northwestern Illinois. You can see those storms rolling through along that front that was just to our south and lucky for us because that front actually and those storms produced baseball sized hail for some of our friends just to the south across northern Illinois. So that was how close it was for us to get some pretty serious damage uh, from those storms. We've been pretty quiet for much of the day across southern Wisconsin, just kind of cloudy and much cooler, about 15 to 25 degrees cooler compared to this time yesterday. But we still do have alert days in the forecast. We could see a few more isolated thunderstorms tonight. Hail and gusty winds, the main concerns there. We're not talking about baseball sized by any means, but some uh, one inch hail not out of the question if those storms do get firing on Saturday. We have a similar setup mainly in the afternoon and evening hours into the uh, nighttime hours. Hail, high winds and heavy rain on Saturday and on Sunday could be possible. So we're going to have to keep an eye to the sky for the next three days or so today. Really not impressed with our severe weather setup, especially with our cool uh, dew points and our cool weather overall. So uh, not I'm not saying we'll, we won't get a strong thunderstorm or two, but it's not looking all that likely. Better chances for Saturday and Sunday. Most of us under a marginal risk of severe weather on Saturday, the southwestern tip of Wisconsin under a slight risk. So for tonight, we're mainly concerned about maybe an isolated spot or two with some hail up to quarter size and wind up to 60 miles per hour. But we've really just been dealing with the cloudy and cool day in spots like Platteville on our Queen Bee Radio Skycam and a similar story in Madison on the Edgewater Skycam. The almanac for today that high occurred around midnight, so 63 degrees, so about 5 to 10 degrees below normal for this time of year. We should be finishing right around 70 degrees for our highs. We're in the mid 50s in Madison right now and in Watertown in the low to mid 60s in Janesville. This northeasterly breeze has been keeping us cooler and drier today, keeping our dew points down and really limiting a lot of our rain chances for the day. Also helps that that front is to the south and west of us. So on future track, not saying uh, we couldn't see a shower or two, so we'll have to have the umbrella ready to go just in case that does develop. And really the scattered shower and thunderstorm chances continuing for much of this weekend. We're watching tomorrow afternoon into the early evening as a front comes through for some stronger to possibly isolated severe weather. And so that will be a concern as we head into tomorrow afternoon and then some more rounds of potentially uh, heavy downpours and heavy rain rolling through later on Saturday into portions of Sunday as well. By the time everything is said and done, an additional inch to two inches of rain possible in spots like Madison, and we could be talking about isolated spots of about two and a half to three inches. It all depends on where the heaviest downpours do set up. So we do have those alert days in the forecast for Saturday and Sunday. Temperatures kind of all over the place tomorrow. In Madison, we may hit 70, but just to the north and east, we could be stuck in the 50s and 60s. We're stuck in the 60s for Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. Monday, we should get a break from the rain. So circle that day on your calendars <laughs> because uh, that's the day to kind of get outside and enjoy the rain free weather because there's not that much of it over the next seven to 10 days. Unfortunately, some slight shower chances as we get into Wednesday and Thursday. So they uh, those days might be a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But overall, this unsettled rainy stretch looks to continue. I think Netflix is going to get a workout this week. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Their shares are going to skyrocket. <laughs> All right, Jay, thank you. So normally on Friday, we preview what's coming up on CBS Sunday morning. But today, Jane Pauly is with us with something special. And Jane Pauly is with us. And Jane, we're going to see you Sunday morning as usual, but do I have this right? Sunday morning also is in prime time tonight. Yep, you got that right. This is a big weekend for us. And it begins with a prime time special tonight, which is all about gridlock. Whether it's your daily commute or just running errands around town, terrible traffic is something everyone can relate to. We're going to have stories about self-driving cars, flying cars, some really bizarre commutes, and just for fun, Ted Koppel gets caught in rush hour traffic with comedian and car collector Jay Leno. Here's a clip. 
This car was the great savior of the American horse. Back before the automobile, New York had 60 tons of manure dumped on its street every single day. And all of a sudden, this thing comes along, a little puff of blue smoke in your face. It didn't seem quite so bad. Yeah. It seemed, wow, this is this is quite an improvement. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was then, this is now. Right, right. right? It's going to be an hour in traffic that promises to be a whole lot of fun, Mark. And in this, and the Sunday morning format, right? Uh, but, a little more prime timey than okay. Sunday morning, <laughs> but the Sunday morning crew. You know, it's all the people that you you know and in our style and voice. And all right, I can't wait to see great. it. And then you are back on Sunday from Florence. Oh, yeah, it is a, a Sunday morning from Florence, Italy. We'll see the sights and taste the food and meet some amazing local artisans and sample wine from a private vineyard, which happens to be the home that rock superstar Alice Sting and his wife, Trudy Styler, reclaimed. Here's a preview of that. It's very dilapidated, and we bought it for a song, maybe two songs. I'm not sure. Once the house was in order, they turned to the fields. They brought back the olive groves and the vineyards. Are you proud of what you've built here? Hugely proud. And the locals come and say, you brought this place back to life. Grazie. And that is under the Tuscan sun. Contributor Alina Cho covers everything from restoring the estate to Sting's music to his seven grandchildren. We hope you'll join us for that very special weekend of Sunday morning tonight and Sunday morning from Florence. We'll just yeah. hand you the keys to the station, Jane. You can take over for this weekend. <laughs> 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 I'm busy. All right, we'll see you this evening and Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. Jane, great to see you as usual. Thank you. Okay, next time. 8 o'clock tonight for this special. Yeah, a lot going session. on. Jane's busy. Busy, busy lady, as she said, yeah. Well, there's more to come before. <laughs> we are going backstage with Michael Bruno. That's right. He talks with a couple of the cast members of the Broadway musical The Bronx Tale, playing over at the Overture through the weekend. That's when Live at 4 continues.
Here's a live look downtown in the Edgewater Sky Cam on this Friday, kind of gray, but mm -hmm. not raining. Not, right down not raining, right. <laughs> Keep well, that up. Well, the Broadway production of The Bronx Tale is at Overture this weekend. That's right. Our Michael Bruno got to sit down with some of the cast members at a perfect location, that being the Italian Workmen's Club on Regent Street. Forget about it. <laughs> the Bronx Tale has been described as a cross between the Jersey Boys and West Side Story. Here is Michael Bruno going backstage. Well, sort of. It's 3 a.m. in the Bronx, New York. I'm on the corner of 187th and Belmont Avenue. This was my neighborhood. This is a Bronx tale. The story is about a, a young boy who witnesses a murder outside of his apartment uh, when he's nine years old. Um, and he decides not to uh, rat out the mob boss who, uh, who did the killing. And so the mob boss uh, befriends him, sort of takes him under his wing, much to the chagrin of his father, who I play. Um, and it's sort of this, you know, struggle for this, this young man's future between these two worlds, his family that loves him very, very much, and, and, and the, uh, the, the mob life that's glamorous and, and that he sees as a possible future. But at the end of the day, it's a story about family, it's a story about love. Um, and uh, Chaz Palminteri, who wrote the show, and, and, and it's actually based on his life story. When he was nine years old, he actually witnessed the killing. And so uh, he, he said that the story is really about two things, you know, that he wanted to get across, that the choices you make will shape your life forever. And the saddest thing in life is wasted talent. And so you obviously play husband and wife in the show. Yes. And are you both of Italian heritage? That's right. So yeah. everything came pretty easily for you when the, course, all the vowels and all the all the, uh, yeah. all the yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. And then we grew up in well, I grew up in New York. She, you grew up in Connecticut. Connecticut so yeah. it's like it's close, you know. Talk to me just a little bit about about the music in the show. There's, there's there's such a broad spectrum of music in this. Obviously, it's there's the you know there's the great doo wop in there, but there's also some really beautiful uh, love ballads and, and really nice songs in there. Yeah, I mean, Alan is the best. And what I say is that he's created a soundscape for the show because you really feel like you're transported back to the 60s in in that neighborhood, and that was really important to uh, you know uh, Jerry Zaks and Bob De Niro. Um, that when you came into this theater and came into the show, you really felt like you were part of the neighborhood. So I have to ask you the big controversial question because it came up last night when I, or the other night when I saw the show. Is like, sauce or gravy? I know. We, uh, it depends on where you are. Like I was telling you the story when I was in Chicago and I was you know out in the lobby after the show. I mean women came up to me and said, what are you talking about sauce? It's gravy, it's always gravy. You tell Chaz it's gravy, but. It, it, I grew up with sauce. I grew up with sauce as yeah. well. And I think it was a discussion when they were writing the show. It was. Like, do we use gravy, do we use sauce? Well, it just, it, I mean, also just literally from a writing standpoint, it sounds better. You know how to make sauce, as was it, you know how to make gravy? It's just, it doesn't have the, the flow, you know, that sauce has. It's not as funny, it doesn't come off as funny. Uh, and so, but we you know, do apologize to our gravy to, people. To we all we the gravy get that people. that's a thing. We understand it and we but respect it, is, it. Yeah. But in our show, because it sounds pretty, we yeah. use sauce. Bronx Tales at the Overture Center tonight at 8 o'clock. Some tickets are still available. Tomorrow at 2 and 8, Sunday at 1 and 6 30. Go to Overture. Dot org. And we learned something about the great sauce gravy debate I today. I, is it gravy or is it sauce? What I, are, I've is... never. <laughs> We're going to have to do some more research <laughs> ah, yes. on this and get back to you. We'll get the crack research team on that. So when we come back, <laughs> grab the tissues. The sequel to A Dog's Purpose is hitting theaters. Yeah, we'll preview A Dog's Journey, probably one I'm going to skip out on and save the tears when Live at Four continues.
Good afternoon. Here's your Friday first alert traffic update. Taking a live look at the Beltline and Park Street. We can see westbound not looking too bad. Eastbound a little bit on the slow side, but what you would typically expect for a Friday afternoon on the Beltline. Average speeds uh, right around 15 to 25 miles per hour in that stretch from Verona Road uh, closer to Park Street. And we're looking pretty good on Stoughton Road right now. Average speed around 35 miles per hour around 20 as we get closer to Verona Road. So your drive time's a little bit slow. University Ave eastbound to the interstate 25 minutes. Average speed of around 35 miles per hour. And some other routes the in the other direction we're also looking a little bit tardy 25 minutes average speed of around 35 miles per hour and that is your first alert traffic update all right thanks so much dave so it is game two of the nba eastern conference championship series the toronto raptors are in milwaukee to face the bucks and our melissa kim is at the pfizer forum a little close last time wednesday <laughs> another close game melissa i know i know Listen, you got to keep it exciting, right, for the fans and for everyone watching, right? Well, no, actually not really. The good thing that the Bucks did do in that game, one, was that they finished really strong. You know, in that fourth quarter, the last three minutes and 31 seconds of the game didn't allow the Raptors to score one. So that was huge. Another thing that's been pretty big for this team is their depth. You know, it's not always about Giannis. They depended on the bench a lot in the semifinals against the Celtics. They depended on Pat Connaughton, on George Hill a lot. And this last game, Brooke Lopez, you know, he didn't score any points in that game five against the Celtics, so he probably was a little frustrated, a little fuel adding to his fire for game one of the finals. So he was the top scorer in that last game, so, uh, putting up a double double. So it really has been honestly kind of cool to see how much this team really grows and improves together and also how they're spreading the ball around. They're spreading the love around when it comes to those points, guys. Well, and people are really stepping up there off the bench, uh, Melissa. What do you think needs to happen this game? Mm -hmm. Obviously, a W needs to happen, but you know, what are some things you took away from Wednesday's yeah. game that really need to happen this time around? Well, I think Giannis definitely needs to have another big game. You know, he was, okay, I mean, let's say he's Giannis. He's still going to be really good, but, you know, he still needs to put up some big points, play some defense. I think defense is going to be really important in this game. It was really important in game one, especially in that second half. And again, the bench needs to step up again. I think that they've done it particularly well in terms of scoring points and, again, playing on defense. So defense and the bench, those are the two things, guys, in this game to look out for. And something else, so what's this deal with the Packers and beer drinking? <laughs> It's all part of the fun factor here. That's the one thing. The Bucks, honestly, they have a really good time when you're watching them play these games. They have a lot of fun, and I think that extends to the crowd, too. Honestly, the really cool thing uh, to see in all these games so far is the support from other Wisconsin athletes. You know, the Brewers were here in the last game, too. They had a box. Craig Council was um, out here courtside, and um, Christian Yelich was here. Ryan Braun was here. We've seen Aaron Rodgers. He was here in the last game, too. And David Bakhtiari has made himself quite a star in these games on the Jumbotron. Um, during the regular season, he chugged, you know, one beer during one of the games. And, you know, it's the playoffs. You really have to step up your game here. So in the last game, uh, game five, rather, <laughs> of the semifinals, he chugged not one, but two beers and then pointed to Aaron Rodgers being like, you go now. And Aaron Rodgers is kind of like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Yeah, but, no, it's it. all in good fun, obviously, of course. And, um, you know, it's kind of cool to see. And honestly, I saw, I've seen on Twitter, actually, in the last couple of days, people challenging him to chug three beers on the Jumbotron and not two. So uh, I will report back accordingly on how many beers he chugs tonight, guys. Hey, the Pfizer Forum. Melissa Kim, thank you. So best friends always seem to find a way back home. Especially when they are furry and four-legged. Mm -hmm. David Daniel has a preview of the new movie, A Dog's Journey. I've lived a lot of lives as a lot of different dogs. But I always found my way back to Ethan. Go! Dennis Quaid, Marg Helgenberger, Catherine Prescott, Henry Lau, and adorable furry friends, big and small, star in A Dog's Journey. Each one of the breeds was, you know, had its own unique personality and, and characteristics, and that made it fun and lively. And in between takes, it was always a delight to hang out and you know, goof around and play with the, the, the dogs. We have a wonderful trainer. Her name is Ani Judd, who found these dogs that were just gorgeous and wonderful. And, you know, she's a very enthusiastic trainer. I think, in general, having them in a scene forces you to be in the moment because the dog is just so in the moment that I think they actually make you, uh, like, a 
a better actor. This sequel to A Dog's Purpose follows a family through the generations. I love mornings with our granddaughter. So did I, mostly because she gave me bacon. Hey, you're gonna be looking pretty good at 80, by the way. Well, thanks, yeah. you too. The film explores the destinies of both dogs and people, suggesting we all end up where we're meant to be. I think uh, anyone that, after they watch this film, they're just gonna be, if they're gonna feel happy, warm-hearted. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. I don't know. Mm -mm. Too many tears <laughs> for me. We'll find out. Will Oper thinks about it on Monday. We'll be right back with a final check here forecast. Dry for now. Yeah, for now. For we now. still could have a few scattered showers and thunderstorms later on uh, tonight into the overnight hours. Doppler track is quiet, but we'll keep that uh, chance for showers and storms in the forecast tonight. Cooler with temperatures dipping into the 40s. We could have some stronger to severe thunderstorms tomorrow and on Sunday as well. All right, keep an eye on things. All right, Dave, thank you. We'll be right back with the news hounds.
All right, before we head off for the weekend, we do have to check in with our canine correspondents, Lola and Louie. They have the best animal stories of the week from around the world. Here's this week's edition of the News Hounds Now Update. It's News Hounds Now Update with Lola and Louie. This week on the News Hounds, some annoyed gorillas. We'll explain this unusual sight. And we'll meet Doug and Barbara. But we begin with something you've probably never seen before. An endangered Matchy's tree kangaroo, Joey, from New Guinea, has begun to peek out of its mother's pouch at Zoo Miami. It's still basically confined to the pouch, where it will continue to develop for the next several months before venturing away from its mother. It won't be totally weaned until it's around a year old. The Joey was born back on October 14th of last year. It takes several months before the little one actually sticks its head out of the pouch. Welcome to the world, little guy. Kind of looked like sheets of paper floating in the water. Cow nose rays grow rapidly, and male rays often reach 35 inches in width and weigh 26 pounds. Females typically reach 28 inches and weigh 36 pounds and grouped together like this, well, it's just another wonder of nature. Now we want you to meet Doug and Barbara. Their endangered African penguins hatched two months ago at the San Diego Zoo. They're the first ever to come from eggs laid by adult birds at that zoo's colony. Staffers at the zoo have been taking care of the pair to get them used to being around people. They'll be reintroduced.